Our laws as it pertains to substances are draconian and bizarre. The psychopaths start this way. He was an alcoholic. Because of social media and pornography, PTSD, love addiction, fentanyl and heroin, ridiculous <laughs> I'm, a, I'm a doctor for <laughs> sake. Where the hell do you think I learned that? I'm just saying, you go to treatment before you kill people. I am a clinician. I observe things about these chemicals. Let's just deal with what's real. We used to get these calls on Loveline all the time. Educate adolescents and to prevent and to treat. If you have trouble, you can't stop and you want to help stop it, I can help. I got a lot to say. I got a lot more to say. And welcome, everybody. Thank you for being here. We are back on YouTube, out of YouTube jail, into the YouTube mainstream. We're also, of course, on Twitch, Facebook, Twitter, wherever else you can find us. Rumble, we are still there and watching you guys. Susan, are you on the Rumble homepage with them? I'll, I will be. Right now, I'm te testing our internet speed to make uh, sure it's That we don't going, have any, right? more, any more glitches. We had a couple of glitches coming in, so if we freeze or something, don't be surprised. We may have um, to start over. Very interested in today's show. We are bringing to you Michael Sanger, S-E-N-G-E-R. Michael P. Sanger is his Twitter handle, which you can't find because he is in Twitter jail, and he will speak to us from Twitter jail. In the meantime, you should check out his Substack, Michael P. Sanger, S-E-N-G-E-R. Uh, uh, dot substack dot com, and the book is Snake Oil: How Xi Jinping Shut Down the World. He has been interested in studying the policies of the Chinese Communist Party and their impact on the world response to COVID. And you've heard me talk about this for a while. I keep bringing this up as sort of a something that has bothered me. Uh, uh, let me just frame it before I bring. And and Michael is an attorney in San Francisco, by the way, and he, so he's a He's a good thinker and brings us lots of good information and hopefully can answer my questions because I've had this nagging concern from the beginning. Uh, if you remember, I got myself in a lot of trouble by saying that the press needs to shut up and stop demanding lockdowns and stop demanding non-pharmacological interventions that, like school closures that weren't being recommended by the CDC or anybody else in medicine. And where did they get these ideas from? China. Italy followed what China did based on nothing. At the time, it looked at me, looked to me like some sort of face-saving maneuver by communist leaders to prevent information or a sense of failure from leaking up to the higher level communist party members in, in, in uh, Beijing. That's what it looked like to me. And then we have the Shanghai lockdown now, which is exactly the same as Wuhan, and Michael will straighten me out if I'm not right about that. Same as Wuhan, and how does that look to you now? Does that look smart? Does that look like a smart intervention? There's Michael Sanger. Thank you for joining us, Michael. Thanks so much, Drew. I appreciate that uh, introduction. Longtime fan of the show. D did I frame this in, in a proper way, and can you set me straight, either confirm or refute any of sort of this, these things that have been flying around in my head? No, I mean, I think you phrased it exactly right. Um, you know, from the very beginning, what we saw with COVID-19 is that the entire response to COVID-19, those lockdowns, has really been one giant snake oil sale, held, hence the uh, title of my book, Snake Oil. Uh, when you, turns out, when you go back and you research all these policies, beginning from those strict lockdowns that, you know, shut the entire world down, brought the entire world to its knees in March 2020, um, you know, they all just go back to what China uh, the WHO essentially rubber stamping and national health authorities as well, essentially just rubbing rubber stamping uh, what China claims succeeded in their, you know, super lockdown of Wuhan. Um, you find China's paw prints on every single one of these policies from the lockdowns to the ventilators, which turned out to be an absolutely horrible policy. Unfortunately, there was a grassroots campaign by um, by medical practitioners to put a stop to that. But in the meantime, in those first two months, uh, you know, 97%, the statistics came out that over 97% um, of those who were put on a ventilator over age 60 uh, were killed by it. I mean, this uh, guidance that came out about these ventilators is just extraordinarily deadly in the early part of that pandemic. You look at, you know, mask mandates, um, you look at uh, vaccine passes, every single one of these policies 
um, and mass testing as well. That idea of you know mass testing both symptomatic and asymptomatic people with these PCR tests. You look at that guidance. The cycle thresholds, which were set you know far too high, you know ninety percent false positive rate is confirmed by the New York Times. You know where does that come from? Where did that cycle threshold guidance come from? That also comes from China, based on what they said to Wuhan. That one lie that, you know, this super lockdown in Wuhan was able to control the virus is, you know, what all the response to COVID-19 was based on. So was it as naive as that, that they that they believed that what Chinese were doing? And by the way, they, who we say when, when we say they believed, the only people I saw believing it and demanding it were non-medical people and primarily journalists. Or school board members. Right. I, that's where I saw it all coming from, and that's why I was freaking the hell out. I couldn't believe it, and and I and or governors who were essentially doing just whatever Trump wasn't doing. So we sort of had another wave that came that emulated China, but it was because it was the opposite of the of the White House policy at the time. Is that am I getting that correct? That is correct. Uh, you know, all those psychological factors go into it. You know, the group think, the, um, you know, tribalism. Um, but, you know, it was a lot of people and institutions pretending to believe this lie that China had eliminated the virus. You go back and you think about the narrative on which the response to COVID-19 is based. The original lie that through this two-month lockdown of Wuhan, the super lockdown where, you know, you had all these people saying, oh, well, China... They eliminated the virus from the entire country because their lockdown was super, super strict. And it's like, you know, we can't do that in democratic countries. But look what China was able to do. You know, they welded people in. It's, you know, apparently that was a secret after all these centuries to eliminating a common respiratory virus. Uh, you weld people in and the virus goes away. So <laughs> through this two month right. lockdown of one city in China, they were supposedly able to eliminate the virus from all of China. But nowhere else in the rest of the world, you know, you look at all the countries around China, their cases were all, you know, soaring to all time highs. But apparently this virus understands national borders very well. Uh, it is complete <laughs> nonsense. This narrative, you know, jumped out of China and infected the rest of the world. But through this one super locked out of one city, it's absolute nonsense. But it like but that is how all propaganda works. And that's what this really is. The entire these policies are not real policies. All, what all of them have in common utterly ineffective and in actually slowing a respiratory virus like SARS-CoV-2, extremely psychologically effective in sowing the idea that there is this super virus. All these policies from, you know, the lockdowns, the masks, the mandating masks, this constant reminder everywhere you go that you're expected to believe that there is a super virus. Um, this, the, you know, vaccine passes, obviously, this, uh, you know, forced vaccinations, this constant reminder that there is a super virus that necessitates this blanket suspension of human rights. And when you think about that, that is the perfect pretext to um, dismantle uh, the principles of the Enlightenment, the idea of human rights. That every single one of these policies, you can see how it's targeted a, a specific set of you know, Enlightenment principles. Um, you look at lockdowns, that's the right to, uh, the right to work, the right to employment, and the right to free movement is undermined by the idea of lockdowns. Then you look at vaccine mm -hmm. mandates and mass mandates. That's the principle of bodily autonomy. Uh, then, of course, you look at, you know, worst of all, this war on misinformation. That's, you know, of course, goes to the heart of, you know, free speech. That's the perfect pretext that, you know, now if you have free speech, it's, um, you know, it, you can't have that anymore because it endangers lives. And these are all, you know, pretexts. It's like, okay, that sounds plausible, you know, because there's this super virus out there, this pandemic, that's too dangerous to have free speech. If you don't think about it very hard, um, if you're, you just sort of say, okay, that makes sense. When you think about it, and it's, you know, in every single political conversation that has ever happened within democratic countries, how have this not potentially endangered human lives, being on one or the other side of that debate? You think that free speech during the Civil War or during World War II did not endanger human lives, but we managed. Right. Um, you know, it actually right. makes absolutely no sense. And that's how all these policies are. They're pretextual. They just have to be plausible enough for you to shut up and just follow orders from scientific authorities. It's a pretext to create that centralization of authority. Where is that coming from? Is that just the psychology of the Chinese Communist Party that got uh, sort of 
co-opted because of an insane panic or, or was that something intentional premeditated in some weird way it's hard for me to imagine the latter it's uh that is an open question there's no question um what has been proven very thoroughly in which i go into great detail about in my book is all the different modes of influence that the chinese communist party used to promote these totalitarian policies around the world um you know through various you know propaganda the influence that they built up in elite institutions over several decades um their ability to manipulate science journals they were able to essentially launder these totalitarian po uh policies into you know what we call the science which we're following follow the science uh all that we now know yeah. extraordinarily destructive and extraordinarily ineffective when did they plan that um it could be that this was essentially kind of a just an extension of the same propaganda they were telling themselves domestically and therefore right. um you know this is just kind of something that i think that's together. it yeah I, yeah that's i think that's possible. it uh, this, this is our this is their this their values it's their operational system it's what they you know want to impress upon their people and therefore why not the world just like we want democracy to to flourish elsewhere they want these principles to flourish and of course people should adopt them because they're right correct yeah, and so it, you know, it's definitely a very um, efficient way of doing that, and that's what makes me think that you know there could have been a certain amount of premeditation behind it. Is a psychological sophistication, the philosophical and psychological sophistication of this propaganda, just how effectively um, this virus serves as a pretext to systematically dismantle these rights, and also the timing of it, because when you think back to that initial lockdown. It's so dramatic. It's just this, you know, um, this really, it, 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 what they're doing is casting millions and millions of people. They're destroying millions of livelihoods, casting millions of people into extreme poverty. That was reported immediately. as something they knew was going to happen immediately when they implemented this policy. But suddenly elites are telling you that's okay. That, you know, ignore everything you knew about, you know, Judeo-Christian values and, uh, you know, the principles the alignment that's okay now because now this is so just don't question that you know we're going to uh you know sentence millions of people to starve just for the crime of being poor and nothing else but that's okay now and that is so dramatic that you know once you've gone along with that with the entire media and all the you know supposed scientists in charge and your own government was telling you that you know you're essentially a bad person if you don't consent to this um you know in the new york times they're comparing people who didn't consent to those initial lockdowns to neo-nazis it's you know hard to remember now that there's a growing consensus that those policies are totally ineffective but you know people were demonized for opposing these policies and think about how psychologically effective that is because once you'd supported that policy especially if you're in any kind of position of influence or power You've now supported a policy that destroyed millions and millions of lives for no good reason at all. That is so difficult to accept. You know, there's only so many people that will accept bribes. There's even only so many people who will, you know, uh, accept being blackmailed. But once your ego is attached to this idea that there has to be a supervisor, especially if you're, you know, you think you're special, you're in a position of, you know, a uh, office, a uh, politician, and suddenly, you know, you've used your power to support this policy that you know has destroyed so many lives it's like that can't be right uh there has to be a super virus like it, it just it conjures that idea into the world it's the perfect way to seed that idea and then what happens is that people want they want they psychologically want to reject any evidence to the contrary so they filter out the right. scientists and of course they're also being told that you know this virus is also a pretext to censor people. You know, those opinions are endangering lives. So we need to censor those people. Only listen to the scientists who are telling you that we need lockdowns. We need mass mandates. We need to dismantle, you know, just one more human right. Just like, look what how effective it was, what China did in Wuhan through their super lockdown. You know, they were able to just two months and they're one and done and get rid of this virus. Obviously, an impossible goal. Because China's data was just, you know, a farcical lie, as I captured on the cover of my book here. You know, you look at it, it goes up, and <laughs> she gives the order, and it all just flatlines. Um, yeah. Absurd premise to begin with, that you get rid of this ubiquitous respiratory virus by just, you know, giving away one more of your rights, just being a little more like China. 
but regardless of what happens with the cases, you know, whether they're going up, down or sideways, the answer is, you know, to get rid of this virus for good, you have to be more like China. So what you're talking about with this ego investment in a particular position is is called cognitive dissonance. And uh, cognitive dissonance is a normal human phenomenon. It's a, it's, a, it's a glitch in our brain systems. And we all have it. We all must fight against it and worry about it because it prevents us from changing course, prevents us from adopting our position. I call it stupidity. Well, it's what scientists are very <laughs> carefully trained to to think against, to be careful that they don't succumb to it. And even with our training, we still succumb to it somewhat. Um, I got a million questions for you. First of all, how, how are people receiving this message that you're putting out there and your data? It's been a challenge. You know, I've been doing this for the last two years, looking into um, China's uh just the influence of the chinese communist party on the response to COVID 19. and how i got around to start doing that you know i like you um saw those lockdowns and i was absolutely horrified you know i did not think that was right for them to you know sentence millions of people um just you know destroy small businesses destroys people's livelihoods and uh you know in the narrative just didn't add up it didn't make any sense to me that you know we were just being told that the world health organization was in the pocket of the chinese communist party but all of a sudden we're supposed to just follow whatever they say uh, and you know implementing these totalitarian policies uh without question um the narrative didn't make any sense but when i went around i think at first in the first couple months i was just looking for people who might be seeing it the same way i was looking for anyone with the platform to get this message out and see if anybody else was looking into it. But I look at, you know, officials, um, journalists, uh, you know, celebrities, really anybody with the platform. I didn't find anybody. And that was the scariest time around April, May 2020, is that I realized that these policies, which had turned, you know, half of the world, <laughs> quickly turning half the world into China, um, there was nobody there seemed to be nobody out there with a platform researching you know <laughs> the influence of the chinese communist party on these policies uh that was terrifying to me and it seemed extraordinarily unnatural um so that got me you know researching uh kind of taking out more and more sort of full time it's kind of a it became kind of an obsession just uh looking into this data and the more you look at the more damning it becomes because it wasn't just those initial lockdowns that came from China. It's every single one of these policies. And this information is all hiding in plain sight. How is it possible that I am the only one now telling you about this? Because the story doesn't begin just in 2020. It doesn't even necessarily begin with Xi Jinping. It dates all the way back to when Henry Kissinger and Richard Nixon reopened China to the Western world. This influence has been building up for several decades. Uh, when we first resumed relations with China, there was this idea that China was a poor country. The Soviet Union was the real enemy, and that's why we re-engaged with China, uh, because it would drive a wedge with the Soviet Union. And that was effective. Uh, the Soviet Union did collapse in part because the, we re-engaged with China. Um, but then there was this idea that China was a poor country. We didn't have to worry about them as a significant threat. So we developed this longstanding policy of change through trade. That meant that we were just going to resume, have these commercial relations with China and basically, you know, treat them as a normal country. And then over time, you know, they would realize that Western values were the way to go and they would become democratic like us. And for a long time, it seems like everything is hunky dory. All the news we're getting from our elites, from, you know, the sources um, who go to China, business people, academics, everything. I mean, it all sounds great. Sounds like this policy is working well. What we didn't realize was that the reason the messaging was so rosy, the reason they were saying everything was hunky dory, was because China was slowly absorbing them into the system. Our systems were slowly merging with each other. And this was so gradual under China's moderate leaders that it was practically invisible. It was in areas like economics, human rights. There are more and more of these absurdities generated by the Chinese Communist Party's propaganda machine began to be normalized and uh, repeated by legitimate elite institutions. This corruption- Give me an example, example of this merging. Describe what you're talking about. So 
you now have elite institutions, you know, some of our elite universities. Uh, one of the more absurd ones is, you know, China always makes these promises that they're going to be carbon, you know, zero in 10 or 20 years or whatever. And so we have policymakers, you know, our politicians say, oh, look, China made this promise that they're going to be, uh, you know, carbon zero. Therefore, we, you know, we have to cut some of our, um, you know, energy production, cut some of our, you know, uh, have to do invest more in this uh, um, sustainable energy. The problem is China never actually takes action on any of it. It's just nonsense. It's just right. this BS that uh, because of the influence that they've built up within our own elite institutions, um, you know, universities, think tanks, media outlets, they're just indulging these fantasies generated by the Com Chinese Communist Party. And this all, you know, it's all hiding in plain sight. You hear all these things. These are all things that we all know. You know, you hear that, oh, you know, China, Hollywood can't write any script. You know, the major production houses will not produce any movie that's overly critical of China or that China doesn't even want. You know, they basically censor, <laughs> pre censor every script that comes out of Hollywood. You go, oh, weird. I wonder why the Chinese Communist Party is doing that. Oh, well, no big deal. And you hear that China is, you know, investing tons of money within our universities. And you think, oh, well, that's nice. So I don't know why they're doing that. You know, oh, well. And you hear that they're sponsoring these really, you know, expensive trainings and developing um, relationships with our media networks. And you go, oh, that's, that's interesting. And you hear that, you know, every single business school, um, you know, sends students over to China to get wined and dined by the party. It's like, wow, it's impressive they have the money to do that. I wonder why they're just like, uh, you know, whining, dining, ordinary young business students. I just, just appreciate being part of the capitalist system that much. What they're actually doing is creating an entire system that normalizes their own totalitarianism, which never actually changed. The first off-ramp, the first sign that this wasn't working happened in 1989 with Tiananmen Square. Going back to what happened then, you had this massive protest movement um, you know, lines of people miles long, you know, even party officials were starting to join in the protests. You know, everybody was just overjoyed. They thought that, you know, um, China was going to go the way that Gorbachev was bringing the Soviet Union, and suddenly you'd have democracy in China. Instead, you know, Deng Xiaoping, uh, the paramount leader, um, sacks the higher officials who um, agreed with protesters. And of course, you know, this just unbelievably violent crackdown just you know kills thousands of chinese people in cold blood as all the leaders rounded up um and the world was horrified just for a couple of years after that uh you know china was isolated but then you know our leaders tell us you know oh, that's okay you know that's uh you know that's over there that's uh you know it's the way things are in china but you know they're still changing so we're just going to go back to normal and resume relations that narrative made absolutely no sense is it okay for a government to just, you know, kill thousands of its own people in cold blood and we're just going to go back and pretend that everything's normal because they're supposedly changing? Um, that made no sense. And now the bill for that is coming due. What happens in 2012? Well, the, the economic, that, the econ, the economic uh, sort of, uh, uh, you know, apple, you know, the, the, the you know, holding the economic uh, potential out there is really what we were going for, right? We weren't interested in paying attention to these other things because the, the potential for the economic benefit to this country and the world was too enticing, too enticing. I, I don't see how right. we could have possibly done otherwise. Yeah. Let, yeah. I, let me, I want to take you back to when you first came to all this. What, what, what were you doing and what did you think as you saw all what you thought you were seeing? I mean, what, so you were horrified by the lockdown. Why, you know, did you tell other people? What did they think about your lack of uh, sort of enthusiasm for what was going on. And then how did you kind of, well, I mean, what's your story? What were you doing at the time? How did you come to this? And how did it sort of evolve? I was horrified. And, um, you know, it's been quite a long journey thinking back to what it was at the beginning. I was just kind of your typical Wall Street Journal, um, New York Times economist reader. I didn't have any platform, Never, basically never used social media. Were you practicing law? Um, yeah. Uh, practicing law, you know, background yeah. in accounting, back in yeah. law, you know, I do tax law uh, full time. Yeah. Um, so, you know, some background in kind of forensics, economics, and uh, just kind of a, you know, passion for history and geopolitics that I'll just, I don't know, I'd be the right person at the right time. But um, 
Yeah, I was horrified. I told anybody who would listen, you know, my Facebook friends, you know, just kind of usual Facebook account like everyone else, told my own family. Um, and, you know, got a lot of pushback, you know. Very few people saw the situation the way I did. I think it's just too psychologically overwhelming. You, know, you think if you're just your average liberal in 2019, it, it, it seems pretty simple. You just kind of, you know, our elites seem to have everything under the control. Uh, you know, all the media is um, telling me that, you know, our elites are doing a great job and, you know, everything is going well. It's You have this kind of liberal order and, uh, you know, um, I wish we were more liberal like, you know, Canada and Australia. They seem to have things, you know, going really well. Just all the news you're getting is all rosy. Um, you know, then what happens is that one day in 2020, you just get bombarded with this absolute psychological blitz that suddenly, you know, you can have no more rights anymore because there's this virus. And the media is prohibiting all debate about this, this just absolute nonsense narrative, this sweeping um, policy across the world. And there's really never been anything quite like that before. Uh, historically, Let me ask you something. Let me ask you, how did you know that the policy, because at the time there was a lot of, let's try to dampen the curve. Let's see if we can, let's see if we can make a difference here. There was a lot of like, well, maybe we can, you know, there wasn't the kind of certitude, the kind of religious weird quality it have got later <laughs> that you were, you were either a good person or a bad person based on your COVID policy. But at the beginning it was like, well, we got to do something. We're planning for the worst case. That, that's why I kind of went along with it, even though I was upset by it. I was like, all right, these guys are trying to do something and maybe it'll work. I don't know. And maybe, you know, two weeks to blend the curve, fine, two weeks, whatever. But but when did you realize that it was absurd? Because it took me a little while to really conclude how absurd the policies were. I just kept saying, I don't understand why we're doing this. Never done it in medicine before. We've never quarantined healthy people. We quarantined sick people. And there was only one lockdown that I knew of in the history of medicine. And that was in the 12th century in Venice in a plague outbreak. And it failed exactly. horribly. Uh, and and that's all I was aware of. And I couldn't understand how magically the policy of a of a you know scientist from New Mexico's high school daughter, essentially. I don't know if you know Dr. Glass and his mm -hmm. daughter and that whole story. I'm sure you know that. That that became the foundation for a policy that it seemed totally insane, but looked just like what was going on in Wuhan, that's for sure. So how did you know it to be an insane policy at the beginning? It just, it, it, the narrative was just too absurd. For me, it was really kind of a human rights issue. You know, I've, um, you know, always taken an interest in, you know, um, geopolitics and what's going on in the world, and that includes the developing world. Uh, you know, first I see Italy implement this policy, and it's just, you know, I think like everybody else, there's just a suck like shock. It's like, huh, Italy? You know, they're part of the free world. They're like us. That well, and, and, sense. and my response to that, by the way, at the time, I went, no, wait a minute. Italy's healthcare system is totally different than ours. They, they are not prepared for this kind of thing. We are much more flexible. Yeah. We have a much more improvisation. We, we can handle this. We, we don't have to do what Italy did. Italy did it because, and by the way, I remember listening to some lectures by the, the Italian physicians, and they botched it all up completely, completely botched it up. And, and, and so that's the policy now, but go ahead, continue. Yeah. And then, um, you know, I see the next place that these lockdowns happen. It happens in a couple other countries in Europe. And then it comes to California. You know, that's the first state to lock down within the United States. And, you know, I grew up in California. Um, it's just, I was, uh, it, that's why I knew something was seriously off. Because, you know, California is a new place. Like, this is the Wild West not so long ago. Uh, just totally antithetical to our values as Americans, um, especially in California, to simply tell everybody that they have mm -hmm. to stay home that they can no longer, you know, mm -hmm. have their business or work anymore. I mean, that just is something seemed very off at that point. Uh, and then what really did it for me was seeing the lockdowns in the developing world. Um, seeing them, you know, just cast millions and millions of people. I, I don't think anybody will ever forget those scenes of, you know, people just thrown out of work in India and South Africa. Uh, and they're just marching in this massive exodus they have absolutely no idea where to go they live thousands of miles away from home or whatever and they're just marching on foot in this exodus completely you know complete disregard for their well-being 
you know, millions and millions of people were killed by this policy. And, you know, they're in these hor- tight packs of people. I mean, it, it doesn't make any sense. And of course, you know, it didn't make sense here in the United States either. You're, uh, for anybody who is, um, you know, in the lower income threshold, you know, you're, you're forcing entire families into tight packed, you know, in closed quarters when this virus, like all right. respiratory where, viruses, where, where it trans- just like happened. the plague, right. where, where <laughs> the, the majority opposite. of transmission occurred. Right. But yeah. Susan, I, I know what, what uh, Michael was saying about China is something that you've been very suspicious oh, yeah. about forever. I was listening. Yeah. But I, you know what? Also, there's one thing that he didn't mention was that Trump really pissed off the Chinese. So it, when he cracked down on the, the, uh, the trade. the trade situation yeah, the currency and you remember a lot of people were buying a lot of property in the united states and then all of a sudden they were selling everything and going back to china so <clears throat> you know there's a lot of rules and they hated trump and then of course a lot of people hated trump over here too so that that part of it really inf- it inflamed everything especially california and we have you know a lot of people coming through california from china you know, through San Francisco and they, you know, they saw the cases growing fast here, but, um, also in New York, but I don't know. I just, it, it's the teachings of communism and trying to enlighten the world with it is something that they've been doing for hundreds and hundreds, probably thousands of years, you know, since, you know, Mao and whatever, but, um, Mao isn't thousands of years. Yeah. But, but before <laughs> that, it was more like, we want everybody to be like China. They, so they, well, everybody China had needs a very to... collective history in their social work, social service system. Right? But, Remember? but there, but when, you know, communism took over and they, that was mm-hmm. successful for them, they realized that the West was a threat. So, um, I don't, you know, I think that he's right on, I think he's spot on with his, um, his history and what he understands, it, it makes total sense to me, but. And people seem to be, wh- why do people react negatively to your messaging? I, I'm confused. You have, it's a point of view. It's substantiated with data. It's made. If you're not sense. a Trump follower too, like if you're, they'll just say you're, you're a. A Trumpite. Yeah. yeah. Or you're but, just a you're Trump not, lover. I assume or something. you're not, you're not, you're not sort of a MAGA person, right? I don't right. Know. No, I was, uh, you and, know, and actually quite politics liberal. shouldn't come into play. Any of this. Yeah. 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 And, and as many, you know, Bill Maher and many, many, many people were and just feel like they were left behind by, by their liberal peers. But but in any event, it, it's I'm worried. I always worry that I'm missing something when people react really negatively to the kinds of things you're offering rather than engaging research, rather than engaging <laughs> with it. I, I always feel like, what am, what am I or missing? Intellectual... What, what is going on here? Why do people react to that? Yeah, they... It's just the data. Just let, engage with it. That's all. If, you're just, if you can find something that suggests otherwise, let's hear it. Wouldn't you say, Michael? Oh, absolutely. Um, but it is very personal. People take it at a very personal level uh, because they know Why? what it means. They know, they know what, it mean? what it means about what they supported. Going back to those initial lockdowns, oh. huge buy-in from the public. It was, it was you know, right. pretty much um, across party lines. It was, you know, all debate was being prohibited about it. It was coming from media outlets. You know, the narrative didn't make any sense when you stopped to think about it logically. The numbers didn't make any mm-hmm. sense. None of it made any sense. Mm-hmm. But you're being bombarded with, on social media, on mainstream media outlets, on the television, from your own and support this policy. The and they yeah. actually so throw in there. Yeah, they did what they were told, yeah, and they, you know, shouted down people who disagreed with them. That's a tough thing for people Ooh. to admit that you know the people they were villainizing and calling neo Nazis were the heroes on this story. They don't want to admit that. And okay, you go <laughs> with elites, policymakers, well educated elites, um, you know, professors. Why have them? Be, they've been such dunces about all this. Like, what, what is with the silence there? Elites, because they're it, all it, socialists. Be. They love it. They love yeah, it. They love to history. be oh, contained no. and hang on, controlled. Hang on. You guys are no, I'm, guys, hang on. You guys are jumping. That, I, that, literally, I, I will defend against those I literally, opinions. Well, I have, that's one, that's I have one in my family. I understand. So. I understand. It may be true, but we, but that's a leap. Well, so. listen, I went to college, but, okay, but, and I studied Chinese <laughs> history. And I, I had my Chinese history teacher was nothing like 
the other teachers, but I had to toe the line to the left in order to pass my classes. A long time ago. And yeah. it's still like that. Yeah. Our kids came back socialist after they finished their, you know, liberal arts education. And I, there's nothing wrong with that. They should learn that. You know what I mean? Not everybody should be on the right, but, but they are um, very protective of, they like socialism. They like communism. They like different things. Uh, thoughts of of government they they promote it you know because they want kids to understand all of it and but I just feel like everybody hated Trump and they had to go as far to the left as possible and it it that yep. was they're the ones locking down not the right yep there's a lot of that you know circumstances like you were saying there was a you know huge revulsion against Donald Trump there was that long time left-leaning bias, and that's largely because of the period we're in. You look at the big events, the last time the uh, political left got something this wrong geopolitically goes all the way back to the early 20th century uh, when they got the early rise of communism in Russia wrong. Uh, the left was big champions of, you know, what Stalin was doing in Russia at the time. That was, you know, horribly wrong. And they got, you know, Hitler wrong. But that is, you know, kind of cross-party lines. You know, kind of everybody supported Hitler back then. So, um, but that was another big thing that the left got wrong. And then they got China wrong as well in those early days. So the left got some things wrong then. But in more recent history, the time in which, you know, policymakers grew up in, the time in which, you know, in living memory, it was always the right getting things wrong. You know, you grew up with Vietnam, horrible for the political right. Just, uh, you know, they were yeah, all in on this true. war that yeah. was completely unwinnable. They were all in on yep. Iraq, another unwinnable war. They yep. were all in on Afghanistan, yep. another unwinnable war. The war, the right just keeps screwing up. Yep. So among the educated yep. classes, it just becomes, you know, loathsome to be on the political right. It's yep. just ridiculous. Yep. Uh, so that is a big blitz when, you know, any sophisticated person, you know, is, you know, on the political left or at least, you know, center suddenly, you know, just like that one day, the left gets something absolutely horribly wrong. Um, yeah. and that, what it comes back to, uh, you know, and let, and let's talk about Chairman Mao and who he was, because we talked about a little bit about modern Chinese history, but this is actually deeply rooted in the history of the Chinese Communist Party. Uh, you know, people, you know, might learn something about Chairman Mao when they're little. The man was, you know, absolutely one of the most brutal tyrants ever in all of recorded history. Um, won the Chinese Civil War. The Chinese Communist Party came to power in the Chinese Civil War. To this day, it's kind of a mystery of how they actually won. But the psychological manipulation, propaganda, is essentially what the party is. Uh, that is their mastery. And they mobilized millions and millions of people to fight for them in that war. Uh, the actual party itself uh, only comprised about 0.01% of China's population, extraordinarily small. But they were able to mobilize you know, millions and millions of people with this idea that you know, uh, suddenly people would be able to share everyone, everything, share everything. It would be egalitarianism for everyone. That turns out to be an utter lie. You know, Mao is one of the most manipulative, um, ruthless people in all of history. Uh, soon after winning the war, the communists win and uh, their rivals are sent out to Taiwan. Soon after, over 80%, within three years after the Chinese Communist Party takes power in China, and they don't tell you this because it's just too grisly and horrifying, 80% uh, of the entire population of China have been re-educated through struggle sections and public ex executions having to partake in those. Um, you know, shortly after that, you have the Great Leap Forward, where the entire population is moving on to communes. Uh, tens and tens of millions of people are killed. It's the largest famine in human history. After that, you have the Cultural Revolution, where all of China's artifacts are destroyed. I mean, it's just this utterly dystopian history. Um, and that comes to an end. And people and are killed China for goes, making art. <laughs> Yep. China is the only history, only country in all of history to actually engage in the systematic destruction of its own historic, its own history, its own historical artifacts. Uh, that's how insane Mao Zedong was, the man who had absolute power over China for decades in the 20th century. Um, yeah, it was Mao, incredible how they did that. 
It's incredible. They how they were able to take millions of peasants and just tell them, okay, you're all equal now. You're all getting a potato sure. sack to wear and you're all going to work in the farms. And if you fight, we're going to kill you. I mean, it, I, it, the armies were all set up and he just, how he did that is just amazing. So, I, so I have a, a bunch of a questions still. Story, yeah. so, so, so how, thank you for reviewing that history. I think it's important that, and, and by the way, just the cultural revolution by itself is a, 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 a chapter of brutality that, and insanity that, if people look at it, just just Google it and see see what you find. Uh, if if you're somebody with a degree or a profession today, imagine your government put, collecting all of you and either re-educating or killing you, all of you, anybody with a profession or education. That's right. That's it. That was the Cultural Revolution. Well, you saw so, it in Cuba too, right? So yep. mm -hmm. when Cuba was taken over by the communists. We've been to Cuba. I mean, everybody's on this island. Like if you need a Tylenol, you, you can find one on the island. I mean, it's, it's just, they have, they're, they're just, they all have to do the same thing. They go to school till they're in the third grade and then they work in the fields and that's it. All right. And they're the educated people don't even make any money. So, you know, we've seen it there too. Well, we, let me just clarify, I'm sorry, but they, I just, ha they have some good arts and they have some good sciences but when we went to the uh, copacabana or whatever it's called they they the uh our guide we have to have a guide here in cuba was was sure to point out that these are some of the highest paid individual in the entire island the dancers the dancers at the copacabana some of them making as much as 250 dollars a month mm -hmm. um, incredible yeah so so there you go yep. um how, how will history I know, and they're so impressed with it too. It's yeah. like we're we're buying two hundred dollars worth of cigars. You know, <laughs> how, how will history get this? Will they get it right? The, the, what you're describing, or will they see it from your perspective, or at least allow your perspective to be part of the historical narrative? I, I'm not just talking about China. I'm talking about COVID. I'm optimistic that they will. Uh, I think it'll take a very long time many years for the truth to finally come out because e people's egos have to dissociate it with it, from it that takes a very long time you know you think back mm -hmm. to vietnam you think back to iraq it took over a decade for people to come around and say you know hey that was a really bad idea um you think back to darker mm -hmm. examples uh the great leap forward in china at the time of mao's great leap forward experts around the world the people who are speaking as experts on china insisted that no famine was happening it was the largest famine in all of human history that was happening at the time. They insisted no famine was happening. It was only about 20 years later that people learned what had actually happened. In modern times, you know, these things are often, totalitarian regimes manage to uh, keep these things hidden at the time. But eventually, as time passes, the truth does come out. The, you know, academics, diligent academics do, you know, just in the background, once everybody else has kind of moved on and forgotten about it, they do their sort of diligent work and they kind of push the narrative uh, farther toward the truth. And eventually, you know, it does go down correctly in the historical history books. And I think that, you know, future generations are going to look back and be absolutely horrified as what it was transpired. You know, there's it's, just it's never been a more Orwellian farce I, 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 in American I, I history. Hope you're right. I, I, I hope you're right. I hope you're right. I agree. That's presumed, I've said it a million I, times. I, uh, can, I agree 100%. <laughs> I hope we get our feet back under us where it doesn't have some repercussions, I, where, you know, the the ability to tell history honestly becomes distorted, much like it has in China. But, but also, uh, really quickly, somebody's making issue about Cuba, talking about their great vintage cars. Yes, they have these they beautiful do. vintage cars in the 50s. They're owned by the government and run by government employees, and you have to pay to get your picture taken with those cars. That's that's how that works. Yeah. There's about, but they make money. And there's only a few hundred of them over there, too. They're really cool, though. They're but they nice. don't have new cars because they're not allowed right. to have new cars. So. Right. So so hang on. I got a million questions. So, so, so there you are uncovering this history. And did, did how did you sort of... Did you just start researching it and then say, I've got to write a book about it? Or how did, how did you start? And then how did you get kicked off Twitter? Yeah, you, you know, do? I started researching and writing about it. Um, and, you know, the smoking gun came around June, July of 2020. So after, you know, a few months of lockdowns, an article came out in the New York Times about um, China's disinformation uh, surrounding the pandemic. It turned out if you go to the bottom of that article, you click one of the links, um, you find this bot campaign 
And what I found was, you know, hundreds and thousands of these bots that had stormed Twitter in every single language in every single country, hundreds and hundreds of thousands of these tweets, all in the exact same words, um, right around March 2020, when the world was going into lockdown, uh, saying how, you know, uh, we're just sitting here washing our hands. That was the line they all use, you know, we're washing our hands while China is like implementing this huge lockdown. And you follow that and it turns out that, you know, bots had stormed every single world leader who, you know, resisted these lockdowns kind of systematically to every single country, you know, every single language. And, you know, um, demeaned and you know, kind of insulted uh, leaders who didn't go along with this policy. Just this massive, unprecedented social media a disinformation campaign um, to try to normalize these lockdowns. So I wrote about this on Twitter, and uh, you know, to my surprise, I actually went viral. And I started to get a huge Twitter following, and I was contacted to write an article about what I found. And so that became my first article. Um, you know, China's lockdown propaganda campaign. You know, uh, mm -hmm. kept writing about it on a sort of a daily basis for the last two years, and developed more and more of a following. Uh, wrote some additional articles. Um, was involved in an open letter to our intelligence agencies who seem to have completely dropped the ball on all of this, uh, along with some other um, you know, big influencers. And the result of my research you know, became this book, which I you know, would argue is my um, sort of uh, the culmination of my work over the last two years. And I really encourage people to read it because it's you know, the best thing that you know, I've produced, um, and I do, you know, wanted to have sort of artistic and historical value. I do think it, you know, meets that standard. The reviews and reception uh, has been absolutely extraordinary. So I strongly encourage people to look at that. That's my, uh, look into that's my best work. How do you get kicked off Twitter? So that was uh, just over a month ago, um, just tweeting about the normal stuff I do every day. Um, and I'd had a, you know, I'd been suspended a couple times, probably eight months prior to that. But, um, you know, really very carefully. You know, I'm a lawyer. Uh, I'm trained to follow complex rules and uh, navigate sort of Orwellian rule systems. Um, <laughs> so very careful to, uh, you know, diligently go way out of my way to comply with whatever Twitter says the rules are. But, you know, I'm talking about, uh, you know, really important stuff on this political bait, debate. Um, on the side that they don't like. The idea that this virus is not this super virus, that it does not justify at, um, any of these suspensions of people's rights. And so ultimately, anybody who kind of takes that position and has enough uh, influence, they ultimately censor. I'd say most of us activists, the vast majority of us who have um, you know, built a substantial following and been active on that side of the debate, just trying to calm you know, people down trying to say that these policies, these mandates are not justified, nor are they scientific, uh, most of us, the vast majority, have been censored, who have been activists within this community. has become kind of a rite of passage. So one day, you know, I um, make a tweet that's very typical for me, but fortunately, it's a very powerful tweet to go out on. The irony is that it got 100 times as much attention because uh, they suspended me for it, saying that, you know, the reason it was a response to an article in the Atlantic, which has been the Atlantic magazine has been very pro -law COVID hysteria. And it was one of these articles saying, oh, you know, there were about a million deaths. And it's like, uh, how are people just moving on and not having more mandates when have a million deaths? Like, how did this become normal in people's minds? And my response, you know, I tweeted the article with a response to it saying, you know, um, the public has, you know, come to accept this because one way or another, though they didn't might not be willing to face the implications of it because the implications are absolutely horrifying that something could happen like this in the free world. Uh, though they may not be willing to face it, they realize that every single one of these policies, from the lockdowns to the mandates, to the vaccine passes, to the tests and death counting, has been one giant fraud. Obviously, just a statement of opinion. Uh, I don't think any reasonable person, I don't even think an unreasonable person would read that as, a, as anything other than a statement of opinion. But you know, um, an hour later, uh, I find out that, you know, typing mid sentence that my account is now currently suspended. There's no seven day suspension, yeah. which you usually give people, uh, you know, that's kind of a last warning. They just suddenly that's it. Um, you know, I s appeal and they say, you know, this suspension is permanent. Um, please do not appeal again. Basically. <laughs> well, some of this, I, I wouldn't, I don't know that it was fraud. 
what happened to Dr. Fauci and Dr. Birx? I mean, they still, I understand the, the ego investment, and, but they, they are, you know, people I've looked to for decades for guidance and good opinions. They still believe that they were doing something right. I, I don't, they never asked for school closures. They never asked for some of the draconian sort of action that some of the states took. I almost wonder if they didn't appreciate what they had brought. Like they didn't really get what was happening in California. They lived in the in the isolated bubble of D.C. and didn't really. I don't not sure they ever fully got what what the consequence were of some of their policy making. I think in a lot of ways they were repeating uh, what the media echo chamber just repeating that back to them. Um, they were telling people what they wanted to hear with absolute cavalier attitude to. Um, you know, the implications of what these policies would actually do. You go back to what Fauci was saying just, you know, months before, and this is common to a lot of the health officials that have been influential throughout COVID. What they were saying just, you know, months before is that you should never do anything like lockdown. It's just an absolutely horrible idea. You know, you have Fauci is quoted as saying, oh, you don't mess, that's the stupidest idea, don't do that. People, you know, make these hysterical decisions. And soon after, he's endorsing them. What changed there? Um, you know, I think Fauci is very much just a political animal. He just, uh, you know, tells people what they want to hear. And that it's, was, it's you not, know, it's, it's not been my changed. experience of him for 30 plus years. It really has not been. I, I, there's, I feel like I, it, I need a better explanation than that. I'm sure that's part of it. I'm sure he is a political animal, but it's it, something, it, it's just so peculiar to me. I and mean, people I've really, and by the way, when I got myself in trouble, by the way, by just telling people to calm down like you, and then what I, but the part they cut off of every statement I made at the time, which was listen to Fauci, listen to the CDC, just do what they tell you, which, you know, CDC never asked for school closures to my knowledge, or at least for, you know, not until it became commonplace, then they started sort of accepting school closures, what it seemed like, which by yeah, the way, it's common to a lot of we'll these policies that they simply accepted yeah. what, you know, was being done that just kind of became normalized yeah. because they, everybody's so terrified of being on the other side of that debate, seeing what was going on with people on the other side of that debate. It was all narrative control. And I would argue that that is, these policies are fraudulent for that reason, because they're not part of any Western pandemic plan. In fact, it's the opposite of what no. the right. pandemic plan said that you should do. They were yeah. not adequately tested or debated in any real mm -hmm. scientific still, sense, still you know, are. unprecedented in Western history. Yeah. Um, rather, they were just taken from China based on, you know, what China said they did, uh, yeah. but said was effective. That is not, to me, a legitimate source for policy within a democratic country. Uh, Drew, you how said is that, that possible? Yeah, I've been saying it forever. It goes back to, I've been saying it, forever. it goes back to the influence that the Chinese Communist Party has built over our late well, institutions. Let me... But here's the thing. Why do you get kicked off Twitter for that? Like, it, I mean, it's just like they're not helping the situation by just saying, OK, we'll get rid of this guy because he's going against the narrative, you know, and it, it I didn't like when we couldn't say hydroxychloroquine or you couldn't get hydroxychloroquine or you couldn't say ivermectin. People are trying to help prevent people from dying, you know, from COVID before we had the vaccine. And that that's yep. the part. Like if you said ivermectin on, on YouTube, you'd lose, you know, you'd get a strike, which I'm probably going to get one again today. Anyways. Just for saying it today. Yes. Yeah. But I, yeah. that's I mean, what I, bothers I me. Know. Like whether or not you're right is... I don't know exactly what I can't speak for what's going through their minds, but those, you know, totalitarian decisions have become very normalized, especially, you know, over the course of COVID-19. They just got so used to censoring anybody on that side of the debate. That it doesn't even matter if you're diligently following the rules that they, you know, say in their own tweets. It's just anybody who, you know, is on the other side of the debate is supposedly endangering lives. And they ban you just based on that pretext. It's the perfect pretext for the sort of totalitarianism. And that is the biggest danger because even though these mandates have been rolled back for the time being, you know, they have not been denounced by, you know, most left-leaning states and countries. They simply declared victory and said, oh, we saved, you know, tons and tons of lives, but we don't need these mandates anymore. Really, it's just a response to how yeah. unpopular they became. But they did not actually denounce yeah. the policy. And so now you're stuck with this yeah. norm, which was definitely one of the goals to begin with, that elites can, you know, just claim something as science, just, you know, yeah. suspend human rights anytime they want, just based on these vague promises yeah. that doing so saves lives. And you see how normal this has become to many folks, you know, especially on the political left, 
to um, just ignore these rights and how, you know, they now feel that free speech is somehow a danger to democracy itself. And, you know, it's like they have that will to power. You know, it's getting one, of the, one, of the fen- one, one of the phenomenologies I have uncovered in all of this is in my profession, the, the big risk factors uh, for trouble occur and have occurred repeatedly over the last 150 years with the first opioid epidemic, the opioid crackdown, the second opioid epidemic, psychosurgeries, psychoanalysis, each of these each of these disciplines, pain management and the overprescribing of opiates and then the the covid response, what you find is some period of centralization of dogma and authority like some discipline picks up and said, you know, psychoanalysis is the only effective means of treating mental health patients. Um, lobo- frontal lobotomies is the only hope. And we're going to solve all the, the patients with chronic schizophrenia and make them comfortable again with a frontal lobotomy. And the centralization occurs. But the next ingredient is the leaders in this centralized movement have to perceive their task as a holy mission. They'll often use that word. I, w- I thought I was on a holy mission to end serious mental illness. I was a holy mission to end pain in America. I was on a holy mission to help you know the the Civil War veterans with uh, hypodermic needles and morphine. The, this these this sense of a holy mission is when it goes wholly horrible for humans. So keep an eye out for that. I wonder if politicians have a similar thing that goes on. That is an absolutely excellent point. It, COVID is the perfect pretext not only to introduce those totalitarian policies, but to create a sort of fanatical cult because they believe they're saving lives. And once they get into that, they've invested so much into that, just, you know, demonize anybody who disagrees with them. They are so <laughs> invested in the idea that there's a super virus that is just going to, you know, so super deadly and just like you can't have human rights anymore, that they become fanatical about that policy and believe that everything is self-justified. That anything they do yeah. from, you know, censorship to, you know, demonizing their neighbors to, um, you know, um, abandoning the poor and the working class, that's all justified because they are saving lives from the super virus. It is the perfect pretext to create that sort of religious zeal. That holy mission, right. The uh, What does Dr. Z-Dog call it? The Covidians and the Covidiots. Those are the two the two holy categories, holy, holy camps. Um, I... I want to switch to China again for a minute, and we're going to show some videos of, and Caleb, if you could also find the videos of the trucks rolling down the street, pouring chlorine, the the kinds of videos that came out of China at the time struck me as particularly strange. Or here are people just dropping over in the street. Oh, boom, I'm dead. That's it. That's the, that's That's why we have the policy we have in Wuhan. It It looked to me almost like, you know, the trucks rolling down the street and these weird videos that with people in white suits that didn't make any sense to me, almost as though they were ready to hand that the the Chinese in Wuhan, the government locally, had this kind of policy ready to go, you know, this sort of intervention, should there be a leak from the lab? It sort of looked like something that they were sort of prepared for. So is it possible that all of this is the result not so much of a desire to distribute their propaganda and their totalitarian ethos, but really they knew something and didn't want to be blamed for it and were doing what they thought they needed to do to clamp it down the way they had prepared for in the first place. No, um, it's not a believable response because the Chinese Communist Party has been has been widely confirmed, was aware that this virus was spreading by November 2019 and shut down Wuhan until January 23rd. I mean, unless this virus moves at the speed of a slow turtle, um, you know, that is not going to do any effect. That said, the Chinese Communist Party historically just kind of makes up reality as they want. And that's what we saw in Wuhan was the entire lockdown was just theater was for domestic and international mm-hmm. consumption. Um, and mm-hmm. what we saw with those videos, you know, the world's first impression of this virus 
was, uh, you know, those fear videos that people are falling dead in the streets and they're just, uh, you know, piles of bodies everywhere and, you know, people having these seizures and they're welding people in. That was everybody's but why did they do that? Before we really had any why data. did they do that? Why were they so, why were they so anxious to push that out? That to me, it felt like something like they were trying to save face or, or I don't know, felt like something. I don't know. Yeah. That's what's scary. Wonderful ever know. It? It was what point of yeah. releasing a bunch of videos of people falling over dead it painted the chinese communist party in a very bad light the idea that you know they were just letting all these people die and they were you know abusing older people and people were just horrified by these images you know welding these poor people in that looked like a so real fall to me though <laughs> ouch it's them all terribly so what is the purpose of that the only really reasonable purpose is to sow fear and a lot of that you know you look at what city did they choose to shut down they chose to shut down the city with this lab in it. Um, that is obviously complete nonsense that you're going to stop a lab leak that occurred, you know, back in 2019 by shutting down a city three months later. But that is absolutely terrifying. Um, not only did they, you know, the dictator shut down the city with a lab in it. Uh, you know, uh, there's a lab in the city that you shut down. Now you're getting all these videos showing that people are falling over to the desk. We didn't know at the time that this virus is spreading since November 2019. And we thought it had just started spreading right then. Uh, so it looks like, you know, China is responding to this actual super virus and they're doing everything they can. You know, St. Xi Jinping, um, you know, is, you know, helping the world by implementing this lockdown. And, you know, he's going to save us all by, you know, putting his own people through this. You know, what a great guy. Um, no, that's all theater. <laughs> Uh, and of course, yeah. you know, the whistleblowers, we start hearing stories of whistleblowers and it all is this narrative that, you know, oh, these whistleblowers were uh, blowing the whistle on the super virus coming out of Wuhan. And then you hear about the World Health Organization. You hear that, you know, they are in the pocket of the Chinese Communist Party. Um, but, you know, that's only relevant for the fact that, you know, they were downplaying the virus at the start. Really, it's the super virus and they were, you know, trying to hide that. Uh, you should still do it with they, whatever they say with response to COVID-19. Uh, that entire narrative falls apart because those videos were um, completely fake. The lockdown policy, we now know, is completely fake because, you know, those months after they knew the virus is already spreading. Um, the whistleblower stories were fake. The story of Lee Wen Lang, which is all over, you know, mainstream headlines. Everything that formed our initial impression was fake. But what who, who was that guy? It, because that that's yeah. the, that video he took of himself on a ventilator looked totally fake to me. Yeah, completely. With trying to be, yeah, I'm afraid. Yeah. yeah, I looked like he was completely yeah. good health, but it was you know. How did you find that out? How did you? How did you? How did you find that out? My contact, uh, you know, dug into the story, and it turns out that you know this entire story of Li Wen Lang uh, was actually produced by one of the Chinese Communist Party's older, oldest propaganda outlets. A month after it supposedly happened. The guy's name doesn't even appear until, you know, um, a month after these events supposedly happened. And that story just gets rubber stamped by our top media outlets. Um, and, you know, our own security agencies, that's why you have this bipartisan pro lockdown consensus at the very beginning, just eat this up because, you know, they're hawks and they think, oh, you know, only the Chinese Communist Party would stoop so low as to endanger millions of lives of the super virus. So they want to do everything they can. And, you know, the scientists are embarrassed because they funded this lab and now, oh, it looks like it might have leaked a super virus. It's all a false flag. There was no super virus right. leaked out of a lab. Or if, you know, if it was a lab leak, it happened long before the lockdown of Wuhan. But the Chinese Communist Party did everything in their power to make it people think there was this lab leak to get this universal buy-in for these strict lockdown policies. I'm buying your book right now. So, so if um, I love it, if if um, if I just did, me too. Yeah, I bought it for you. If you you're trained as an attorney and you're trained to look at um, multiple angles on an argument, if you were to be critical of your position and the data you presented, what would your analysis be? How how would you attack your position? Thinking of some of the best critiques I've had. Um, I think, you know, some folks have presented some arguments that, uh, I, I would say this, um, you know, it's entire poli entirely possible that groupthink played a much bigger role in this uh, than I've been arguing. 
Um, and would you and would you call it the <laughs> mass formation psychosis the, the the that Peter McCullough was talking about mass mass yeah. the sort of hysteria really mass hysteria is what it was. Yeah, I, I think back to one of my favorite articles by um, you know one of my contacts who sees it a bit differently. He sees public health as this institution, a relatively new institution in the uh, grand scheme of things. Uh, didn't really have a clearly defined role as to, you know, they had all these standards. They were very well educated. In history, they Speaking would glitching. successfully eliminate a virus. Sometimes in history, they would simply, you know, um, uh, they couldn't eliminate a virus like a uh, respiratory virus. And they didn't really know when to apply mandates, like when that was appropriate, like what, how much influence was supposed to have over policy. Mm -hmm. So, you know, they just like uh, the public wants them to do something about it. And so they start, you know, implementing more and more mandates and there's more and more fear and every mandate it has is counterproductive and just makes people more scared. So it's all just like this big sort of cluster. And I think there's a lot of truth to mm -hmm. that. I think public health as an institution was not really clearly defined in that they were supposed to be doing. Um, that said, you know, this same um, contact of mine does agree that, you know, the Chinese Communist Party um, deliberately instigated these events to a certain degree. It's simply undeniable when you look at the evidence that's, uh, that's been presented that um, their own propaganda looked to sow fear of this virus and um, promote their own totalitarian response to it. And, and l l let me go back to the public health uh, argument and uh, talk about the, the centralization and the holy mission theory that I put forward. I noticed about 15 years ago, a lot of physicians had MPH after their name, like Masters of Public Health. When I was in training, you would never do that. Why would you get that? What, what, do you, what does that do for you to have an MPH? Well, part of that training is to prepare for your holy mission when there's a pandemic, it's a preparation for the mission. It's like being an astronaut or something. And not only are they prepared for their holy mission, many of them aren't physicians. There's our, in our LA County, it's a sociologist running public health. And when they are physicians, they're often pediatricians. And the pediatricians don't really understand adult medicine. I don't understand pediatric medicine. I wouldn't be making decisions about pediatrics because that's where most of the vaccine programs are directed at pediatrics. So the public health guys became pediatricians. And so they're on a holy mission. They're not properly trained. They're sociologists, so they don't understand risk reward or clinical judgment. It's a speaking of a cluster and it's poorly defined role in the constitution, what it's, what its powers really are. That has to be hammered out in the court. Do you agree with that construct? I absolutely agree with that. That's a debate that I think we're inevitably going to have to have in the aftermath of this is what is public health's role? I think at the very minimum, it needs to be seriously scared back, scaled back. Now, or, or, then there's a or darker the training part of that different. story. Yeah, yeah. It, a darker what? part of that story what? is um, with public health, how did it get to be so big, so ill-defined, and uh, so influenced by the Chinese Communist Party? Why did the Chinese Communist Party going back for over a decade, build up this level of influence in the World Health Organization, cultivate it so carefully. Yeah. We've heard that this happened, Money. but of course, you know, yeah, we were told the exact opposite of the real reason. We were told that, you know, um, you should still follow whatever the WHO does. Why did we follow this organization that is known to be completely in the pocket of the Chinese Communist Party? Because the World yeah. Health Organization is being used as a front organization. That's how the Chinese Communist Party was able to get so much mileage out of this organization, knowing even though everybody knew that it was in the pocket of a totalitarian regime. Because when the mayor of Florence, or the mayor of Los Angeles, just suddenly announces, oh, okay, you know, I'm just going to shut down Los Angeles and, uh, you know, suspend everyone's rights. And, you know, maybe I'll follow the rules, maybe I won't. And it, because, like, the dictator of China did it. No, you can't do that. I mean, that's downright treasonous. There would be no buy-in. But when that same policy goes up through this, you know, fancy-sounding institution, the World Health Organization, um, and you know, wait a minute, that's in the pocket of the Chinese Communist Party, but your own leaders are telling you that's okay. Your media organizations are telling you that's okay. Follow them anyway. Um, you know, there's a super virus out there. Follow it. It gives this cosmopolitan veneer. Uh, to these totalitarian policies. They're essentially front organizations that these totalitarian policies are laundered through. 
And that same cosmopolitan veneer you're seeing all over the world. And that's another um, you know, psychological effect that has a big impact on well-educated people. They see, you know, all these fancy countries, uh, you know, um, France is doing it. Our you know, liberals love France and, you know, Canada and Australia. It gives this cosmopolitan veneer to these policies that are totalitarian and brutal and dumb and unscientific and ineffective. Yeah. Um, and, and their beloved did... Scandinavia didn't. Correct. So yeah, what was odd. the goal that Chinese Communist Party had with, uh, you know, building up this influence in the World Health Organization? Um, so that is sort of the punchline of what we are getting into with Chinese history. We went into Mao, uh, the absolute tyrant. We went into the pure moderate, moderate leaders. In 2012, what happens is that Xi Jinping takes power in China. And Xi Jinping is fanatically loyal to Mao Zedong's original communist ideas. His idea is that the capitalism communism cannot survive. Now, one of these systems is soon going to have to die out. The world is going to have to pick one or another. And of course, as he sees himself as the um, leader of communism within the world, he knows you know, which system he's going to choose. Um, you know, he issues these papers saying that you know, human rights, uh, democracy, uh, free press, all these enlightenment principles are a danger to the Chinese Communist Party. This is all the way back in 2013. Um, and develops this policy of unrestricted warfare, of exporting China's totalitarian system throughout the world very aggressively. So what you see in, and of course you start hearing these awful stories if you follow geopolitics about his system of concentration camps, um, which again goes back to the Chinese Communist Party's combination of public health and security policy. It's the same policy of lockdown is inspired the system of concentration camps. Uh, and then in 2020, um, that influence that the Chinese Communist Party built up in the Western world over decades, Xi Jinping, essentially what happened is he pushed that into its highest gear. And so you're bombarded with this propaganda campaign, this influence operation at all levels, at the personal level, with this social media propaganda telling you um, to support these lockdowns, uh, through media organizations um, telling you, you know, support these lockdowns and there should be no debate about it, through universities, you know, they are strongly incentivized not to criticize China or question, you know, they're obviously fake data. Um, and then through, you know, influence over politicians. It's this very, you know, this huge psychological blitz. Suddenly everybody is believing this absurd lie, but it's like, huh, you know, these are all really smart, intelligent people. Um, and they're supporting this. There must be some truth to this. And so what happens in March, 2020, is that using this influence that the Chinese Communist Party has so carefully built up, and which you know our security services have let their guard down about after the Cold War, uh, Xi Jinping is able to snap his fingers and say, you have no more rights. And you look at the New York Times, and you look at the Economist magazine, and they turn to you and go, yeah, I'm afraid the boss is right. You have no more rights. And I want to ask a question. Real, real quick, though. Okay. Um, uh, the World Health Organization did push back midstream. They started saying that lockdowns were a bad idea. I, I remember quoting them quite a bit, and it only caused poverty. But then, then they were sort of dissenters within the World Health Organization that were advocating that. But go ahead, Susan. So in Shanghai, <laughs> what's going on with the lockdown? Mm -hmm. I think it's a precursor of a bigger thing. What do you think? I mean, that's a, that's a whole nother story what the CSB is doing right now in Shanghai. You know, they're keeping the idea of a super virus alive, this idea of containing a super virus alive. Um, and part of that is because, you know, they have to go by this lie. You know, they can't sit down with every Chinese Communist Party member and say, yeah, this is a lie, but you have to pretend it's true. They just you know for the vast majority of members, they have to pretend it's true. But it does keep it alive. And so, you know, they can declare victory anytime they want. And we get back right back where we started with, you know, our scientists saying, oh, look, you know, China did it again. They eliminated the virus. That's just more proof that these uh, policies, these mandates are really great things. I've got to wrap this up. Um, there's, you know, I think we did a pretty good justice. Now I got to go read the book and make sure I collect all the data that you've uh, <laughs> accumulated. You, and I know um, somebody did it, Drew, I, for you. It's I, awesome. I know. I, I do. I, I I don't remember how I found you, but I knew I was interested in your point of view. Uh, I do hope history catches on to a lot of this. 
Uh, I, I don't have the faith that it will have the same clarity that you have or interpretation that you have, but I at least hope that when the day is done, we will understand that this was a, a particularly what we did to children, what was a, was a scandal. It was a giant scandal. Uh, if we don't, as you pointed out repeatedly, um, not only will it happen again, but the forces that were uh, driving it will have their way with us. Is true. there anything you'd like to say in closing? It's true. No, I mean, I agree with everything you've said. What's happened is an absolutely heinous crime. And I think future generations are going to be fully aware. And as blistering as, you know, people are probably thinking, like, this guy's got a blistering message. I think our children are, you know, compare what I said to what they're going to have to say 20 or 30 years from now. And what I'm saying is going to be nothing. Uh, they are going to be absolutely horrified and it's going to be, it's a monumental shift in our political discourse. Um, you know, I remain very optimistic that, you know, the truth will come to light. You know, we're winning in this. Uh, I don't think whoever is behind this did not count on, you know, the sophistication of our resistance and just kind of the spirit of, you know, the Western world and how much those principles mean to people. The mandates have been rolled back um, and there is a big political shift. You know, and I think that we have warded off totalitarianism in a lot of ways. Um, the ideas, my arguments have uh, gotten a really big reception and more and more people are finding out about it every day. Michael P. Singer, S-A-N-G-E-R, right, S-E-N-G-E-R, I beg your pardon, on Substack, Michael P. Singer dot Substack dot com. Thank you for joining. I hope you'll come back and uh, after Singer with book, an E. With an E. Uh, and, uh, Correct. I hope you'll come back again. And, uh, as, as this evolves, we'll have more to say, no doubt. So thank you so much. Thank you so much, Drew. The pleasure's all mine. Thanks so much for having me. God you. bless you. Well done. Thank you. You too. And, uh, Susan, I, I knew you'd be interested in this cause you've been having your spidey sense up about the Chinese component. You know, of this all I'm along. just, uh, I, I'm just blowing smoke out of my ass. I don't know what that Well, you've been very this, worried about it, but you had a sense that something more was up. And yeah, this I mean, is, Michael's got a clear... I understand communism. A lot of people don't even know what that means. Yeah. You know, like yeah. the younger generations, they don't really know. They're like, oh, we need to be socialist in this country and we need to... It's like, I don't know. You, you should probably go to China, see how you like it, you know, and then come back and let us know. Because it, it is something that is bigger well, and what I, we I'm, can, not, I'm not completely you know, unless you convinced. I, he has a very specific point of view. I'm not convinced that that's the whole story because he did say, you know, this could be a mass formation psychosis. There could right. be sort of a psychological piece. Yeah, but that's how the Chinese and, are. They, they're they not going to go to war. They want to do it all I, psychologically. No, I understand. I understand. And it, 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 can, it can all be true, right? Everything can be true simultaneously. It's, it's not, listen, it has to be one if, or if it was a communist plot, <laughs> they got their way. But, our economy but, uh, sucks. Well, our kids are screwed up. But, we're all weak. Yeah. We all feel how, like yep. we have psychiatric problems yes we're taking true. drugs and dying it's true we're we're right. drinking yes we're you know we're having Preach. no sex which is totally wait wrong a minute. Wait a minute. we're <laughs> 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 our so, kids are having no sex yeah. they were they were they didn't have a life like yeah. i know i just I, had to I throw hope, that in. and but, i hope they're angry about it no but they're, they're getting their way and it just it, i think they're laughing their ass off every time we get on an airplane with a mask on. Well, we're not. Anymore. Which, by the way, the CDC wants to bring back. No, they're suggesting you wear a mask. They're not mandating it. Oh, they're not. I have okay. no problem. Suggest you wear a mask all you want. I encourage people that are want to protect themselves get a well fitting. I wore N95. one the other day. Do I don't it. know why. I forgot I had it uh, on. But, but but if you are if you're fully vaccinated and you have and you have a, 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 a hybrid humidity and you don't really care, then yeah, don't, don't wear yeah. it. It's a, but don't think you're protecting anybody else because you are not. But listen, we, I have to go. <laughs> I didn't mean I've got to make another, you mad. I've got another call to make. This, this is one of these I gotta days. I got to go unload the groceries. So, Caleb, you know. thank you for producing this. Uh, Michelle, thank you for um, uh, booking Michael. Caleb, I think your mom might enjoy this show. I think she might like this one, uh, don't you think? Yeah, yeah. That, that's where you uh, found him. Is my It was my brother who recommended it, and then I looked into okay. the book. I thought, oh, this guy might have some interesting stuff okay. to say. Oh, okay. okay. I don't remember how I found <laughs> Caleb's, it, but I knew it's uh, Caleb's brother but, is producing now. That's yeah, good. Yeah, <laughs> but uh, we're, we're, I'm open to these interesting ideas. And, and thank uh, you, Caleb, for getting us out of YouTube jail. It it felt good. We may not last hopefully long. Hopefully today won't put us back. Yeah. There. <laughs> <laughs> right. I, we should have probably stopped the show midstream and sent everybody over to Rumble just in case, but I forgot. 
Well, so. it, well, we'll see. We'll see. It is just, and I did push back on my little. If bit, we we'll if we get censored, I just want to let everybody on YouTube know that we appreciate you be there being there today. Just keep an eye on if you're on locals. We send out notifications of whether whether the show will be on YouTube or not. We also put it up on Twitter, and we also or have just it on subscribe Facebook. and Rumble, and you'll get the message from there. Right. So if you and by the way, I have no great affiliation with Rumble. They just I just like I I, I go like them. They don't where, censor where, us. Where I can go, you know what I mean? They, but they, I don't. Do they send out notifications? Notifications right as the show starts. Rumble. Yeah. Caleb. Caleb. Some sometimes, but I usually send them out. If people sign up at drdrew.com, then they'll usually get an email when the show okay. goes. I actually posted one today. Okay. Oh, you've been doing that? Okay. Oh, so please do that. You. Sign up at drdrew.com so we can tell you where to watch. Yeah, the show, we're so. we'll be on Twitter though we, every day um, before the show. So if you want to know where to find us, if it doesn't pop up on your stream, it means we've been We like doing these. We've been I, censored again. I hope you like listening to them. I think they're very interesting. And if you have suggestions, as I as I've said repeatedly, contact at drdrew.com. We'll be in tomorrow. Tomorrow at two o'clock, two o'clock tomorrow with the one and only Tyrus. Yes. Be back with that. We'll see you then. Christina's gotten way, <laughs> she ran kids too much, too much. She, she's, she's getting soft. That one was fun, right? It was fun, but I'm not used to her. It sort of makes me unsettled that she's sending these in. <laughs> I like how you're uncomfortable with cute shit now. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Ask Dr. Drew is produced by Caleb Nation and Susan Pinsky. As a reminder, the discussions here are not a substitute for medical care, diagnosis, or treatment. This show is intended for educational and informational purposes only. I am a licensed physician, but I am not a replacement for your personal doctor, and I am not practicing medicine here. Always remember that our understanding of medicine and science is constantly evolving. Though my opinion is based on the information that is available to me today, some of the contents of this show could be outdated in the future. Be sure to check with trusted resources in case any of the information has been updated since this was published. If you or someone you know is in immediate danger, don't call me, call 911. If you're feeling hopeless or suicidal, call the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline at 800 273 8255. You can find more of my recommended organizations and helpful resources at drdrew.com.